And we're going to start in verse number 26 and uh, go through the end of the chapter. Um, interesting portion of scripture. And uh, sometimes you get to parts of the Bible and you begin to study it out and you find yourself with more questions, you know, as you get into it. You, you answer questions and you enjoy, and I, I thoroughly am enjoying studying, you know, this book and the book of Romans and especially chapter 11 and all it has to say. It ties in a lot to what um, Brother uh, Reichman said on Wednesday night um, as far as the Jewish people are concerned and how God's not done with the Jewish people and they need to be reached as well. Um, uh, it ties a lot in with that and he even referenced some of these verses while he was here Wednesday night. Um, but I'm finding myself with some question that I, I'm not getting answers to and so we're going to do a little bit of a study. We're going we're gonna to finish this chapter tonight and if time allows it, we're going to do, we're going to break off into a little bit of a study um, of the Abrahamic covenant um, uh, of God's using, okay, Israel and the Jewish people and uh, you know, what, where are the Jewish people at now? And, and what, what does all this mean, right? So um, uh, we're just going to, we're going to continue uh, chapter number 11. It probably won't take us the entire time to go through the rest of the chapter. Um, hopefully, maybe not, uh, maybe so. But either way, um, as soon as we get chapter number 11 done, we're going to break off a little bit and do a little bit of a study. Probably start it tonight and then continue and finish it up um, last week um, on God using the Jewish people, Israel and how he's using them and, and where they're at now. Um, we noted, and we talked a lot about, um, uh, you know, the Lord setting Israel aside and how that is to our benefit. They were not cast away permanently, and we see that in verse number one, right? Uh, say then, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, right? God has not cast them away permanently. But I want you to notice what it says here in verse number 15. Um, uh, later on down here we see, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, in other words, they were cast away so that the world could be reconciled. Now that's a different meaning of that phrase, cast away, right? Verse number 1 tells us they were not cast away permanently. God's not done with Israel. And there's, there's abundant evidence of that in this chapter. However, they were Set aside, okay, verse number 11 says, I say then, have they, speaking of Israel, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. So they did fall, but they did it for a reason and for God's reason, and so that salvation can be brought to the Gentiles. And so this casting away in, in verse number um, 15 is not a permanent casting away. God's not done with Israel. Um, in fact, we're going to look as we get into chapter, verse number uh, 26 um, that God certainly isn't done with Israel and will continue to use um, Israel and regather Israel someday. And he's got a plan for Israel. Um, but there, temporarily being set aside, right, is for the benefit of the Gentiles. It's for the benefit of um, all that are not uh, Israel, are that are, all that are not. In fact, the Bible says... Um, in verse number, uh, see verse number, verse number eight, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense for them. But let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. And so God has designed it for Israel to be, you know, darkened. Their eyes are darkened. They are set aside for a while. Um, but then we see in verse number 25, this interesting phrase, verse 25 says, For I wot not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. That phrase, in part, is a reference to a time frame. Blindness for a certain amount of time is happened to Israel. And we know that's the case because it's the next sentence says, until, right, that's, that would signify there's a time frame here, right? Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So, um, so we see how Israel has been set aside for a, a time. And we talked about this in the Old Testament. Um, you see a pattern of this. You don't see the church in the Old Testament other than um, through possible um, types or, uh, you know, through, um, 
uh, you know, you may see a type of the church in the Old Testament, um, but you do see the church age and gaps that are in the Old Testament. And we, we looked at some of those last week, that gap of time between, you know, the event of Christ ascending and then the next event would be, you know, um, uh, or the event of Israel rejecting Christ. The next event would be Israel being regathered. And what happened between the rejection of Christ and the regathering, the church age. And there's a gap of time there. We looked at several examples of those in the, in the Bible. And so I uh, spent a lot of our time, in fact, the last time we were together talking about those. So tonight we're going to pick up in verse number 26. And, uh, and, and we'll go through this and through the rest of the chapter as, as the Lord directs in this. So let's have a word of prayer. And uh, we will get into our Bible study for tonight. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much for this time we have to be in your word. Lord, I pray that you would direct my thoughts as I, as I teach tonight, Lord. Give me the right words to say. And Lord, may I not misrepresent what you would have for us. Um, but Lord, help me to speak what your word says and help your word, Lord, to guide us. Lord, may we know you and may we know your word and Lord, help us not to make the mistake of separating the two, Lord. I pray that you would help us to, to learn more of you as a result of being in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I, I'm tempted. And, uh, there's, there I've noticed there seems to be a, it's come to my attention a lot lately. I don't know if it's a big movement or anything, but there seems to be a separation of the Lord Jesus Christ from his word. And that's very dangerous. I was watching a video of, uh, of, of a guy who was, you know, witnessing to some Satanist. There's some kind of a Satan parade or something. And all these people were dressed up all dark and gothic looking. And, and there was a guy who was a, who was a born again, claimed to be a born again believer. And, um, and he apparently, they, they first showed him on a clip speaking to this very large mega type church. And this guy here, you know, he, he had big, real long hair all done up on the top of his head and wore a bandana and whatever. But anyways, he was, he has, uh, was out on the street at this, this satanic parade and, and, uh, and he, he began to witness to people, try to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he ended up getting the attention of this one person who had these, you know, fake horns on her, his, I can tell if it was a man or a woman, on their head and, and they were all, their face was all white and they're all black and just looked like something that would be, you know, satanic. And so he ended up witnessing to this person. Um, uh, but what happened was it was all very emotional. And he really got this person kind of emotionally involved. And he talked about how he met Jesus sometime in his life. And Jesus spoke to him. And it changed his life forever. And at the end, he said, I want to pray with you. And and he, he put his hands on his shoulder and they put their head together and they prayed together. And, and there was this big thing about how, you know, Christian was able to pray with this satanic, you know, and, and tell him about Jesus or whatever. And, and he never one time quoted one Bible verse. He never gave that person any scripture. Uh, and it was all about his experience and how he met Jesus. And all about, you know, this time that Jesus spoke to him one night and it changed his life forever. You cannot separate the Lord Jesus Christ from his word, from, from the word, all right? In fact, John chapter number one is very specific how Christ is the word. And people find themselves getting into a lot of trouble and going down a lot of rabbit, rabbit trails and going a lot of wrong directions. And they're very emotionally involved and they get very, you know, uh, set down a wrong path when they feel like they're following Jesus. But all they're really doing is is deciding for themselves, and they're becoming their own authority, deciding for themselves, you know, what is right and wrong, and, and their Jesus experience, okay, um, is, it has more meaning to them than the Word of God. And that's, that's you got to be careful about that kind of thing. That is off base. And so, um, and I, I'm not sure why I thought about that, but that just <laughs> came to mind when I was turning to his word. Now we have to let God's word dictate, right? What is right and wrong. God's word is how God speaks to us today. And so uh, we're in Romans chapter 11, verse number 26. Uh, verse number 26 says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall uh, turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them. When I take away their sins. The interesting verse now says all Israel shall be saved. This simple passage 
refutes those who insist that God is forever done with Israel as a people and that the church is the new Israel and inherits every promise ever made to national and ethnic Israel of the Old Testament. And we have reiterated that as it comes up over and over again in this chapter, chapter number 11. All right, God is not done with Israel and God will regather Israel someday. Uh, in fact, that's exactly what it says here. Uh, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there comes out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Um, we are reminded of the enduring character of the promises made to national and ethnic Israel. All right, take your Bibles, if you would, Genesis 13. Genesis 13, verse number 15. And I have the words printed, but I'll turn there anyway. It's always good to look at it. From the Bible, the book. Genesis chapter 13, verse number 15. For all the land which thou saw, a seest, to thee will I give it. Now this is the Lord speaking to Abraham. And what does he say? For all the land which thou seest, um, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, what does it say? Forever. Right? Forever. This is a, an everlasting covenant forever. Genesis chapter 17, verse number 7 and 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generation, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession specifically speaking of that land that the Israel is going to receive, he calls it an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. All right. So here we are reminded, okay, we're reminded of the enduring character of the promises made to national and ethnic Israel. We see that in Genesis 13, Genesis 17. God is not finished with Israel. And Israel is not spiritualized as the church, as is the common teaching uh, today, God will once again regather Israel um, uh, uh, at a time yet future of us. And so um, the covenant he gave to them will last forever. It is an everlasting covenant. Um, the possession of the land is an everlasting possession. And so the Bible is very clear about this. While we see and rejoice in a continuing of God's work through all his people, through all ages, we also see a distinction between Israel and the church. A distinction that Paul is sensitive to here. And so Israel is separate and different than the church. Um, and, uh, and, and, we, and Paul makes that distinction here in, in this passage of scripture. Now, this does not mean there will be a time when every last person of Jewish descent will be saved. All right? Um, instead, this is a time when Israel as a whole will be saved people. And when the nation as a whole, specifically his leadership, especially his leadership, embraces Jesus Christ as Messiah. We have seen other places in Scripture, right, where, um, uh, where it is referred to all of Israel. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1, and 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1, it, it talks about all of Israel. It doesn't necessarily mean every last one individual in Israel, but the Israel as a nation as a whole, okay, uh, was involved in these situations. Um, there may be one or two or several, you know, whatever individuals that weren't, but for the most part, as a whole, the nation was. And this is what it's speaking of when it says, all of, all of Israel. Um, even as the apostasy of Israel did not extend to every last Jew, so the salvation of Israel will not extend to every last Jew. Paul is speaking of the mass of Jews when he says, all Israel. All Israel is a reoccurring expression in Jewish literature. It is a reoccurring expression in Jewish literature. Where it, not, uh, where it, not, uh, where it need not mean every Jew without a single exception, but Israel as a whole. And that's from uh, one commentator uh, wrote that. So here we have uh, um, you know, this expression in verse number 26. And so all Israel will be saved. All right, this is speaking of national Israel. I want you to notice verse number 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Now, in verse 25, what Israel is that speaking of? Speaking of the nation of Israel. That blindness in part has happened to national or the nation of Israel. 
it would be inconsistent to change that to somehow be a spiritual Israel of some sort. It is speaking of the nation of Israel. Now, this is difficult because most of Israel right now is rejecting of the Messiah. And for all of Israel to be regathered again and to receive their land means they're all going to, it's going to be some kind of great revival as they realize who the Messiah is. Um, but this is all throughout scripture. They're seeing who the revival is. Um, turn over to Hosea. Let's remind us of one of, the, one of the passages we looked at last week. Hosea chapter number 5. If we can find it. Hosea chapter number 5. And uh, I didn't mark this because I just thought about it, but um, I think it shows clearly the, um, what I'm talking about here. Anybody have it? Because I'm not finding it. It's in there. I just saw Joel. <laughs> Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, chapter number 5. Here we go. Hosea 5, verse 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. So this is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he say, right? I will go and return to my place when? Till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. This is speaking of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is going to, at some point, seek out their Messiah. The Lord is going to return to his place until that time comes. Notice, if you would, chapter number 6, verse number 1. Come, let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Now, here we have a reference to, I believe, a, the tribulation, right? Come and let us return unto the Lord. Um, part of the tribulation is the regathering of Israel, a time when Israel will realize they need to go back to their Messiah. And they, it says in this verse, for he hath torn and he will heal us, um, he has smitten and we will, he will bind us up. So um, we have here an example of the Lord returning into his place and he will be there until a time when they will be uh, restored again, Israel will be regathered once again. Of course, between verse number 15 of chapter number 5 and verse number 1 of chapter number 6 is the church age in which you and I are living uh, today. And so there's a time when Israel will, be, Israel will be regathered to the Lord once again. We see that in this verse, verse number 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall... Um, Turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Notice that verse number 27, when I shall take away their sin. It reminds me of Daniel chapter number 9. Now, Daniel chapter number 9 is an interesting passage of scripture. Daniel chapter number 9 is um, the Lord, you know, speaking to Daniel and giving him a, a vision of things that are going to happen Notice, if you would, Daniel chapter 9, verse number 24. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 24 says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So there's 70 weeks. Right? Now, we're not going to get into the whole prophecy and explain all of this. Other than to say, there are 70 weeks total. There's a break of time between the 69th week and that 70th week. Um, that break of time is an, an undefined amount of time. We don't know how long it is. That is the church age. And that's explained in the, the rest of the verses. But what happens at the end of the 70th week? So when the church age is done, that will kick off the last 70th week, right? And at the end of that 70th week, what happens? And this is what it says here in verse number 24. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's exactly what is being spoken of in Romans chapter number 
uh, 11 in verse number 27. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins at the end of the 70th week, the regathering of, of Israel. So um, this is a, uh, a promise made to Israel. This covenant God um, will remain true to. And we see that um, spoken of in Daniel chapter number 9, verse number 24. Uh, and so, but this is my covenant unto them. A covenant, by the way, a promise from God to his children, the children of Israel. A covenant that, you know, not all covenants are like this. This covenant, this, we call it the Abrahamic covenant. We're going to look at that in a little bit as we have time. Um, it is a covenant that um, uh, is not dependent on Abraham or Israel in any way. Um, if they don't hold up their end of the covenant, they, they break their end of the covenant, um, it is still true to this day. Not all covenants are like that. We refer to the Mosaic covenant or the covenant that was made during the time of Moses. And, and that God would bless them if they were obedient and God would curse them if they were disobedient. And the Bible talks a lot about that at the end of the book of Leviticus and, and other places where we're seeing the law of God being distributed. Uh, but that being said, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant God made with Israel from the beginning, has nothing to do with the actions of Israel as an everlasting covenant that, that can't be um, uh, uh, broken. And so, and he says, well, this is my covenant with them. All right, so this covenant cannot be uh, ruined or, or taken away because of something Israel does. Uh, verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. All right, so... It says also speaking of verse number 28, okay, Israel becoming cast away and the enemies to the gospel was for our sakes, all right? And we saw that here um, in these verses. Um, let's see here. Look, 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 let's see what verse number 12. Maybe this will help us shed some light on this. So we, we, we saw that in verse number 8, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear, unto this day, right? Um, a stumbling block, a recompense unto them. Let, verse number 10, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and, and bow down their back always. This is their fall. Verse number 12 says, for if the fall of them be the riches of the world. And, and the fall of them certainly is the riches of the world. Um, the Jewish people, Israel, rejecting their Messiah when he presented himself as king, set up the stage for him to go to the cross, and that fall of them, that rejection of them, that them being cast away, is what opens the doors for the gospel to be available to everyone. And that's what this verse is saying here, verse number, verse number 28, right? Uh, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Okay? They, they have rejected it, but they've done it so that the gospel can be available to everyone. They're enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sakes. Okay, for the father's sake is a reference to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice, if you would, verse number 16. For if the fruits, first fruits be holy, the lump also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So Israel is holy or sanctified or set apart for God's purpose. And why? Because the first fruits, Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Jacob were wholly set aside, right, for God's purpose. And, uh, and so, um, uh, concerning the gospel, they're enemies for, for your sake. They're enemies of the gospel so that we can receive, we can have the gospel. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sake, or for their father's sake, or for their root, okay, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and their forefathers, um, for their sakes, all right? Verse 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance for God will not change his mind on this um, this is God's plan really God's plan for the ages from the beginning that all of this would take place like it does that you and I could have the gospel um, uh, God will not change his mind on this the gifts and calling of God are without repentance the word repentance means a change of mind um, God's not going to change this this is what God has set in place verse number 30 30 through 32, for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now, uh, now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. God is able to get mercy upon everyone because of his overall plan here. We now have an opportunity for salvation because of Israel's unbelief. Because of their actions, we have obtained God's mercy. Because of God's mercy, 
extended to us, they have an opportunity for mercy as well. And we see that in these verses, um, uh, uh, verses number 30 through 32. Um, notice, if you would, verse number 23 and 24. Verse 23, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again, speaking of Israel. For if thou wert cut off the olive tree, which is wild by nature, that's the Gentile, and were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted in unto their own olive tree? And, uh, and so um, uh, part of the reason right, that we have accepted the gospel and, and the gospel available to us is to provoke them to jealousy. That's what verse number 11 says. For I say then, have they stumbled that they should not fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. And so part of what's going to bring the nation of Israel back again is they're provoking to jealousy by, uh, because of the uh, acceptance of the gospel by the Gentiles. Now, verses number 30 through 36. If all of this has been confusing to you, these are your verses right here. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And there are no doubt, there is no doubt, all right, there are things in the scripture that we may never understand. And someday we're going to get to heaven, uh, and it's going to be very clear to us. And praise the Lord for that time. Um, and, you know, I believe it's going to be an amazing thing to read the Bible when we're in our glorified bodies in heaven someday. And we'll all make perfect sense. And all the questions that we have now will all come together, right? It'll, be, it'll make perfect sense to us. And we can flip to any portion of the Bible and read it. And it'll all come together. And it'll all see why it ties in together and how it's all interwoven. It'll all make sense to how that all works. And it's going to be a great, a great time for now, right? For now... Um, uh, the depths of his riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how his ways pass finding out. Um, uh, really, the, the, the word of God is so in-depth and there's so much beyond that we will ever totally, fully comprehend. You'll never exhaust its resources, as I've often, often said. And so, wonderful, wonderful truths of the word of God. You can spend your whole lifetime studying the word of God and barely scratch the surface. Sometimes I will go into my office, um, not very often I have this opportunity, but occasionally I'll have an opportunity to go into my office and not have really any interruptions all day, and I'll be able to study out a topic or a, a passage of scripture, and, and I just love, love those times to be able to do that. Um, but sometimes I will be at it for several hours and feel like I haven't accomplished anything because there's just so much more that I need to research and need to know. And so uh, it, it, you'll never exhaust the resources, praise the Lord. So take your Bibles if you would. I want to take a few moments that we have left and sort of start into a topic. Um, uh, with the time we have left, we're, we're about 15 more minutes before our time is up here. Take your Bibles if you would, back to Genesis chapter number 12. Now, one could look at the Bible and see in Scripture... Four major plans, right, that God has. Four major, you can break it down into four major plans, right? God's plan for the angels, and that's a very interesting study, by the way. God created angels, and he has a plan for them. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting, they seem to have a free will, um, but no plan of redemption. And it's just an interesting study, the plan for, for the angels. So we have God's plan for angels. We have God's plan for the Gentiles. That would be everyone who's not part of the nation of Israel. That would be the nations of the world, right? Um, and then we have God's plan for Israel. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Very quickly, we're just going to get into the beginning of this, not very far into it. Uh, and then we have God's plan for the church. The church is a separate entity that we know about today that they did not know about in the Old Testament. They had, did not understand or recognize what the church was in the Old Testament. And uh, so it is a mystery to them, but unveiled to us today, the church. And so tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about God's plan for Israel, 
sort of begin to open this up a little bit, and then we'll continue with it next week. So we see God's plan for Israel originated with his call of Abraham. Genesis chapter number 12, we see here the call of Abraham. Abraham is called from his father's house. The Bible says in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So here's, it's the big deal, by the way, to leave your father's house. Your heritage, your father, where you came from, um, in this culture, was huge. And for him to just get up and leave, and by the way, he doesn't even do it right away. We won't get into that right now. Um, but for him to get up and leave is a big deal. It's quite a step of, of faith to have to do this. Um, but the Lord tells him to do this, and, and from thy father's house and a land that I will show thee. So he's going to go to a land, not exactly sure where he's going, but God's going to show it to him. Notice what he says here to Abram, verse number two, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What an interesting phrase. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This call of Abraham included blessings. Certain promises were given to Abraham personally as we look at this, what happened here. Okay, God would make him a great nation. He said, and I will make of thee a great nation. His divine blessing would rest upon Abraham. He said, and I will bless thee. Abraham's name would be great. He specifically said, and make thy name great. Abraham would be a, a blessing, and thou shalt be a blessing. Abraham would bless those who bless, um, or God would bless those who bless Abraham, and curse those who curse Abraham. This is what he said in this verse. Talking to Abraham, he said, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. Now, um, we have to accept the Bible for its literal, literal interpretation. This is what it says, and this is what the Bible means. The formation of a great nation, he mentioned, okay? So he gave um, uh, promises that were given specifically to Abraham, and we see that, right? God would make him a great uh, nation, a divine blessing will rest upon Abraham. Um, uh, uh, his name would be great, he would be a, uh, he would, uh, be a blessing, he, uh, any, any na nation that God uh, would bless that blessed him, and he would curse anyone that cursed Abraham, they're all specific blessings to Abraham, but then there's also mention of the formation of a great nation. It says in these verses, and I will make of thee a great nation. There's a little bit of a hint to what's going to be coming from Abraham, a great nation. These blessings of Abraham and his descendants would reach out to all families of the earth. Not only is he going to make of him a great nation, it says in verse number 2, and I will make of thee a great nation. It says at the end of verse number 3, um, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So he's going to, uh, there's a formation of a great nation, and these blessings of Abraham and his descendants would reach out to all families of the earth. Everybody would receive blessings as a result of this promise God made to Abraham. So we see already in this first passage of scripture dealing with the Abrahamic covenant, we see three things, right? We see promises to Abraham. We see promises to a nation, a nation that would come out of Abraham. And then we see promises to the blessings of the rest of the world, which would be the Gentiles. So we have Abraham and we have Israel and we have the Gentiles. Later we see these promises are added, added to. Um, chapter number 12, verse number 7. Verse number 7 says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, Unto thy seed will I give the, this give, uh, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So now there is a land that is specifically being given to Abraham. Genesis 12, 7. Um, this promise of land is reiterated in Genesis 13, verses 14 through 17. The actual dimensions of the land are recorded in Genesis chapter number 15, verses number 18 through 20. So here we have this promise that included, uh, on top of the fact that there, you're going to be blessed, and on top of the fact that uh, you're going to be a blessing uh, to others, there'll be great blessing on you, and anyone that blesses you will be blessed, anyone that curses you will be cursed, the forming of a great nation, uh, uh, and then that nation being a blessing to those around the world. Um, uh, on top of all that, 
you're going to receive a land. It specifically mentions the land that they will receive in Genesis 12, 7, Genesis 13, 14 through 17, and then the actual dimensions of the land are, are, are recorded in Genesis 15 through 18. Further details are given concerning God's promise in Genesis 17. Take your Bibles over to Genesis 17. Genesis 17, verses number 1 through 8. Genesis 17, verse 1, And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram, his name is Abram still at this point, when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, he's speaking of multiplying him exceedingly. Verse number 3, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. So uh, his name is changed. Abraham um, would have many descendants and multiply thee exceedingly. It says in verse number two, Abra Abraham would, have, um, would be the father of many nations, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Abraham will be fruitful, and kings would come from him. We see this in verse number 6. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And so, um, in recognition of this, his name will be changed from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, father of a multitude. And so, we see the Lord continuing to work with Abraham and continuing to show him um, these promises. Now, um, uh, this covenant is limited to his son Isaac. Now, Abraham had other sons, but the Bible is very clear that this covenant will not go to all of his descendants as in his other son, like Ishmael, but it will go to and is promised to Isaac. And we see that in Genesis chapter number 21. Genesis chapter number 21, verse number 12 says, and God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And the Abrahamic covenant, all those things that were promised to Abraham, are now going to pass down to Isaac. And there's other scriptures to, uh, uh, to back this up. We won't go into those tonight. And then that covenant is then limited and given to Jacob and his 12 sons. Genesis chapter 28, verses 13 and 14, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land wherein thou liest to see, uh, liest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in all thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is God speaking to Jacob in chapter number 28, right? So all that being said, we're going to end with this, right? We have many things that are described that are all part of this covenant that God made with Abraham that was passed down to Isaac, that was passed down to Jacob. That covenant, that promise that God made with them, that would be the covenant he would continue with Israel as a nation. Several things here. Abraham's name shall be great. Abraham shall personally have great blessings. Whosoever will bless Abraham will be blessed, and whosoever will curse Abraham will be cursed. From Abraham will come a great nation. Abraham will be the father of many nations. Kings shall come from the line of Abraham. Abraham's seed shall inherit the land from the river Egypt to the Euphrates River as an everlasting possession. God will be the God of Abraham and his seed forever, the Bible says. Abraham and his seed shall conquer their enemies. In Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. The covenant with Abraham will be an everlasting covenant. The promises are narrowed to the seed of Isaac. Abraham had other descendants, such as Ishmael. And then the promises further are narrowed to the descendants of Jacob. And Jacob has other descendants as well, such as Esau. And so we are seeing now this Abrahamic covenant, this promise by God, all right, to move on to um, his specific 
um, line of sun. Now, next week, I'm going to talk to you about what all does this include as far as who's going to receive this blessing. Now, one of the questions I've been asked over the years is, you know, God has promised certain things to Israel. Can we claim those promises? Those are for Israel. Are they for us? Is there part of this Abrahamic covenant that was simply for Abraham? And part of this Abrahamic covenant that was for uh, the nations, the Gentile nations? Part of this was for the descendants of Abraham? I mean, how does this all work? How does this all break down? And we're going to talk about that a little bit um, next week because we've laid the groundwork here of the Abrahamic covenant, what it is. And uh, the question now is, what all is involved in this, um, uh, you know, the seed of Abraham and, and all the seed after thee, all those that will be blessed by Abraham and this covenant God made with him. Who are they all and how will they be blessed and will they receive the same blessings as Abraham did or as the nation of Israel did? And when, who gets the blessing and who doesn't? Who gets what blessing and who doesn't? And uh, so we'll discuss that next week. All right, let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to take up some time to take up a prayer request. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to, to get into your word. I pray that you would be with this study as we get into it and, and uh, as we consider, Lord, how you do have a special plan for Israel and uh, you do have a time when they will be regathered once again and Lord you have made a promise to them and you're going to carry through with that promise Lord you've made a promise to Abraham and you were faithful to Abraham and carrying through with that promise you made to him and Lord part of the promise is that all the families of the earth will be blessed and Lord we are blessed as well as a result of this promise you have made and Lord, help us to be able to discern these things from your word. And Lord, speak to us through your word as we study these.